Hello everybody, I'm Professor Sara Newby and my specialism is in Roman art um, and in Greek art also and I'm really interested in the way that Greek culture and Greek cultural ideas such as myths, athletics, things like that were received and um, re-explored, represented in the Roman period. So what I'm going to look at today with you is an aspect of that which is Rome's use of Greek myth um, and we're going to look at one particular example which is the story of Theseus and Ariadne. So some of the things I'm interested in us thinking about are how did the Romans respond to the stories of Greek myth? They inherited all of these stories through their religion, through their literature that they acquired from Greece, through their, their knowledge of Greek culture, um, through their exploits in the Eastern Mediterranean when they, they brought back with them lots of artworks. So they were really familiar with all of these stories, but which ones did they pick up on and how did they represent them in their art? How did they use them? Um, in their own contexts. So we're going to think about how is a story shown in art and in particularly how does the same story appear in different contexts. So the two uh, contexts I'm going to be looking at are funerary, uh, so in the tomb on funerary art, um, specifically on sarcophagi, and in the domestic context or in the house. So what did these myths mean in these two contexts? Um, so we're going to have a look at the myth of Theseus and Ariadne and I've just given you a passage from Hegonus's Fabulae um, to sort of summarise the myth. Hegonus is a text who's writing, um, he's an author writing in the Roman period um, and he does sort of summaries of, of Greek myths which seem to derive from kind of earlier literary traditions. Um, so these are the sorts of basics that any Roman viewer is probably going to know, either from their own education, if they're well educated, or even if they're less well educated from th seeing stories of myths portrayed on the stage, hearing them talked about, having them sort of told to them as bedtime stories. Um, we, we hear references to sort of nurses telling their um, ward stories of myths as kind of cautionary tales. So they, these stories are circulating in the society quite a lot. OK, so Hegenus says of Theseus um, and the Minotaur, when Theseus came to Crete, Ariadne, Minos's daughter, loved him so much she betrayed her brother and saved the stranger uh, or showed Theseus the way out. When Theseus had entered and killed the Minotaur, by Ariadne's advice, he got out by unwinding the thread. Ariadne, because she'd been loyal to him, he took away, intending to marry her. So I don't know if you know the story of Theseus and the Minotaur, but essentially um, Theseus is an Athenian um, and the Athenians are bound to present tributes to Minos, um, the king of Crete, um, seven girls and seven boys who are then thrown to Minos's um, son, uh, which is actually the son of a, um, in, a um, adulterous relationship between his wife Persephone and a bull. So the Minotaur has the body of a man and the head of a bull, so it's half man, half bull. Um, and so it's represented as this monster who kind of eats, um, murders all of these Athenian youths until Theseus comes along and tackles the Minotaur and frees all the rest of the Athenian tributes. Um, and he does so with the help of Ariadne, who allows him to navigate the labyrinth which um, Daedalus, the master craftsman who is uh, at Knossos, had been uh, had constructed for the King Minos so that he could keep this um, terrible offspring uh, of his wife hidden from view. Um, so at the end of this story, we're told that he says he's going to marry her and he takes Ariadne away with him. And that's partly because she's been disloyal to her father and her half brother. So um, it's probably a good idea to escape. Um, but it doesn't all go well, because then when he gets to the island of Dia, uh, this is the second passage for um, 44. Three, he then abandoned Ariadne. So Theseus, detained by storm on the island of Dia, thought it would be a reproach to him if he brought Ariadne to Athens. So he left her asleep on the island. Liber, this is the god Dionysus, another name for the god Dionysus or Bacchus, falling in love with her, took her from there as his wife. However, Theseus, when Theseus left, he forgot to change the black sails. And so his father, Jaius, judged he'd been devoured by the Minotaur. He threw himself into the sea, which was called Aegean from this. So this relates to a story uh, from the beginning of this episode where Theseus's father, Aegeus, the king of Athens, has told him 
that if he comes back safely, he should change his, the sails on his ship to white sails so that Aegeus will know that he's safe. Theseus gets to do this, the sails are still black, and so Theseus, um, his father commits suicide thinking his son has died. So it's a rather bittersweet to return when he gets back to Athens. Um, that bit isn't really talked about much in the, the Roman images or shown much in Roman images, but these two themes of Theseus's victory over the Minotaur and then his um, abandonment of Ariadne and her rescue by the god Dionysus are very much um, popular in Roman art. So if we start with the uh, Theseus and the Minotaur, we see this quite a lot in um, domestic context or in houses, uh, you mostly on wall paintings, but there is this really interesting mosaic, which I think is almost um, a bit of fun, really. So this is uh, a mosaic from the House of the Labyrinth called, because of this mosaic, um, in Pompeii, where we've got a emblemata, uh, emblema rather, which is a kind of an inset panel at the, the centre, um, which shows uh, Theseus here, tackling the Minotaur. So you can see this sort of man with the head of a bull. So this is the Minotaur. And then you've got all the rest of the Athenian kind of tributes um, watching on uh, at this, this fight. And you've got the various, the bones left over of sort of previous Athenians who have been sacrificed to this um, bull. Um, so this is a kind of scene of drama and excitement. Um, and it's all set in the middle of this labyrinth, which of course, um, is a nice way of showing that this is taking place in the middle of the labyrinth, although presumably he didn't have this entourage of people watching him when he actually, in, in the myth, it seems like he goes into the labyrinth alone. Um, uh, but it's also a joke about sort of finding your way through the house and labyrinths um, are quite popular on mosaics of this period. So it's a kind of conceit, really. Um, so that's just a zooming in on the detail. Most of the paintings, however, don't show the actual scene of the battle, as you see here, but they rather show Theseus afterwards. And this is the sort of victorious thesis. Um, and we see this both in houses. Um, I forgot to put a uh, typo there. Uh, both in houses and also actually in the Basilica Herculaneum as well. Um, so here we've got the victorious Theseus standing here, the body of the Minotaur is on the floor, so you can see him here again. He's always represented as sort of man of a, uh, the body of a man and the head of a, uh, a bull. And then Theseus in heroic nudity, um, just armed with a club here. And then these are the rest of the Athenians um, kind of praising him and the other children who have been saved by him destroying the Minotaur. So this is very much a powerful image of Theseus. And these images might have acted as a kind of role model for Roman men of the sort of the, the, the values of courage and heroism um, that were to be uh, extolled. However, um, we also find in the paintings some representations of the other side of the story as well, the abandonment of Ariadne and in particular actually her discovery by um, Dionysus. So this is one of the abandoned Ariadne in House of Meliega, Pompeii in the peristyle and it was one of a series of small panels which were set along um, a kind of covered courtyard. Uh, so presumably for people to walk around and discuss the paintings and to make sense of the links between them. So here we've got Ariadne um, shown uh, mostly naked, but just draped in this sort of um, garment, um, very richly decorated with jewellery in her hair. And then we've got a kind of um, these figures, uh, Eros here and another winged figure um, pointing at the ship of Theseus as it departs and she's mourning. And this, of course, is a story that's really famous. If any of you done any um, Latin literature, uh, really famously retold in Catullus' um, 64 as well, uh, on the cover letter of the uh, marriage bed of Pelis and Thetis is the story of the abandoned Ariadne. And we get the whole sort of discussion of Ariadne kind of um, bemoaning the fact that she'd, um, you know, she betrayed her family for the sake of this man and all he's done is gone off and left her. So it's very much much seen as a sort of archetype of the kind of the abandoned woman. Um, but it has a happy ending uh, because in the uh, other images, and this is something that's really popular in Pompeii, there's lots of lots of representations of it, we have the discovery of Ariadne by the god Dionysus. So this is one which was on display in the house of the Cathar, uh, Catharist or the Cathar player in Pompeii. Um, 
and alongside a number of other mythological themes as well. And we've got the, again, naked Ariadne. So she's usually represented uh, sort of half naked or fully naked, um, suggesting her erotic charm, so her beauty and her um, and her vulnerability as well. She's asleep in these images. Um, and then we usually have an Eros or a Pan figure who sort of pulls the garment off her and shows her to the god Dionysus who appears here and he falls in love with her, decides to make his wife, his consort, and uh, they all both live happily ever after. Um, so it's a story of uh, abandonment and redemption. Um, it's a story that we can think about the kind of the morals of in, in kind of contemporary context. We can think about the way that actually Ariadne doesn't seem to have much agency of her own. She at the beginning, she she's very um, influential. She's very powerful in giving uh, Theseus the thread that's going to escape. But once she decides to go off with him as a wife, she's just sort of batted around between two different men. So it very much represents kind of the hierarchical uh, male dominated society of the time. Um, but you can also see it as a kind of a love story that has a happy ending because she finds this this um, uh, you know, she exchanges a human uh, prince of Athens for one of the gods. So she she does OK in the end, um, if, if that's how you want to look at it. OK, um, so what meanings did this myth have in a domestic context? Um, scenes of Theseus and the Minotaur, I think, are very much about stressing his courage. Um, and actually, Ariadne doesn't get much of a look in there, really. She's she's just sort of, you know, she's done her part. They're all focused on him again, so quite male centric um sort of androcentric view of life um and the, the 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 rewards of the gratitude of the other figures um who he saved um you can also see it in terms of ariadne as a tale of kind of thwarted love stories and there's lots of these there's lots of images of kind of tragic loves um people who fall in love with the wrong people like uh Phaedra, for example who falls in love with Theseus is later on in the story, Theseus' stepson, uh, Hippolytus, or her stepson, Theseus then um, Hippolytus. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the ways it's often paired with other mythological scenes in the house. Um, you can see the discovery as kind of pointing towards um, celebration of Dionysus and Bacchus, as he is in, in Latin, the god of wine, the god of revelry, the god of sensuality. Um, so all the sort of the good things in life, the, the kind of hedonistic style, side of um, Roman culture. Um, and I think that's one of the meanings, particularly when you see it in kind of garden scenes as well. They're very much playing on this idea of the garden as a place where you can kind of let down your defences and enjoy life. Um, and there may also be discussion points. So different guests would bring with them different thoughts about what these meanings, myths meant in a particular context. Um, so that's particularly when we see them in, say, uh, exedras, which sort of rooms off the uh, off the peristyle or in the dining room context or in a, a peristyle as well, where people can walk past and discuss the paintings as they go. Um, so now I want to move on to think about how was this same myth shown in a funerary context? And we're going to be looking at three sarcophagi. Um, sarcophagi are marble chests which uh, are built to contain the body of the person who's died. So they come from second century uh, AD or CE um, onwards. And there's a change in Roman funeral practice around this time from cremation, where um, up until the end of the first century, um, mostly bodies were cremated and the, the ashes were buried in small cinerians to um, inhumation, which means the actual burial of the body. Um, now, clearly only the wealthiest people are going to have a marble sarcophagus. So we're looking at a fairly sort of elite sector of society here. Um, this is one of the earliest sarcophagi, a garland type of sarcophagus, um, which dates to the Hadrianic period in New York now, uh, but came from Rome. Um, and this is a really nice one, I think, because it shows three episodes from the story of Theseus and Ariadne, um, which you see in the, the, the lunettes along the front so above the garland. So you've got these garlands carried by Erotes, and then you've got these three little scenes. And in this one, we've got the door of the labyrinth. So this is the one on the left, the door of the labyrinth with um, Ariadne handing out the thread to um, 
Theseus, who's on the other side. So this is her sort of explaining to him that this is the way he can escape from the labyrinth. So it's the moment at which she decides to help him. In the middle scene, we've got the battle. So this is quite similar to the one that we saw in the mosaic. Um, Theseus here on the left um, with the uh, minotaur sort of fallen to his knees. Again, uh, body of a man, head of a bull. Um, so the fact that he's sunken down sort of foreshadows the fact that we know that he's going to be um, successful, uh, that Theseus is going to be successful in the end. Um, and then on the right, we have the sleeping Ariadne here and Theseus um, running off to get onto his ship. Um, so what does this mean? Um, obviously, it's a retelling of the myths. At the simplest side, it's sort of just telling us the story. And we know all of these images from paintings as well. So it's drawing from the repertoire of images from paintings, uh, from, from the, the domestic sphere. But do these images have a different meaning when you see them on a sarcophagus? And I think you can see them also as a kind of allegory for um, the situation in which the, the, the grieving um, person might find themselves. So uh, it has a resonance for a particular sort of relationship between, say, a married couple. So the fact that you've got Ariadne here actually appearing, showing, uh, giving her help to Theseus, draws attention to her role in the whole exploit of the Minotaur, which, as I've said, isn't always shown before. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got her here being abandoned. Now, in the story of the myth, of course, this is him abandoning her, um, deciding not to marry her. But if you see this in the context of a, a tomb, which holds a body, then it may also be an allegory for the way in which death is like a form of abandonment. So if we um, think that perhaps the person buried within was a man, uh, this, myth, this myth might have offered a kind of parallel to his grieving widow, um, that she is sort of left grieving, uh, abandoned while he goes off. Um, and so the boat in which he's actually going to go off to Athens could also take on overtones of things like the boat to the underworld as well. Um, so it has a kind of funerary resonance, in which case you can also see the central scene of Theseus's um, valour and courage as kind of suggesting that the person who's buried within was like Theseus in his bravery. Presumably he didn't defeat any minotaurs, but um, Roman sarcophagi quite often like to sort of zoom in on particular qualities, particular values that are um, held by mythological characters and then the idea is that those then sort of uh, we, we're told that those values were held by the person who's buried within as well. So I think that this is the story there's a there's a retelling of the mythological tale but it's also relevant to a married couple um, because we don't always know who's married within these tombs and as we'll see sometimes when we do it sort of changes the focus of the myth a little bit. Um, so the next one I want to look at is much later. So this is from the third century. Um, and this also shows the story of Theseus, uh, but rather differently. So here we have Theseus on the left um, saying goodbye to his father as he goes off to, um, to Crete. Uh, here and then here we have him on his ship with the um, abandoned Ariadne uh, down here. And what's interesting here is that all of the faces of Theseus have this portrait carved onto them. So this doesn't look like an ideal mythological use. This is actually a portrait face of the um, person who's buried within. Um, and the figure of Ariadne also has a portrait um, face uh, and a, a particular kind of period hairstyle that's popular in the middle of the third century. Uh, on the right hand side, we can see also that this alludes to his um, uh, defeat of the Minotaur, here's the dead Minotaur lying on the ground. So we've got kind of three different scenes. We've got him saying goodbye to his father Aegeus, we've got him um, leaving uh, Ariadne on the island um, and uh, getting into his ship, and we've got his sort of victory of the Minotaur on the right. Um, and what's interesting about this sarcophagus is that when it was found, it was actually found with a lid, which unfortunately is lost now, but the lid had an inscription on it saying that it was dedicated by a mother to her 17 year old son, Artemidorus. And that makes sense when we look at the portraits because the, the figures of this boy, he's shown clean shaven, um, he's shown with a very sort of short hairstyle. This is quite typical of youths of this period. Um, 
And then his mother has this sort of older face and this hairstyle as well, which ties her in with the, the, the period of the third century. So it seems here as though actually the mother's portraits have been put onto the figure of the abandoned Ariadne rather than, say, a wife. Um, and that this alludes very much to the sense of grief that this mother feels in the loss of her 17 year old son. So the scenes of him um, with his victory over the Minotaur suggests again his kind of prowess, his valour, that he was a, uh, a good, strong, brave um, youth. Um, and then the departure here from her, the, the, the sort of abandonment of Ariadne can be seen as an allusion to the sense of abandonment that she feels by his death. And again, his um, even his father gets a, a look in here as well, as he's sort of saying goodbye, again, alludes to the pain of death. And then my final one is looking at um, the abandoned Ariadne and her discovery by Dionysus on funerary art. So again, this is a scene that's really popular in sarcophagy. We find lots and lots of these. Um, and you find it with her as an idealised figure. And there the stress is very much on the kind of the Dionysiac revelry, the fact that they're all dancing and drinking and having lots of fun and seems to allude to the idea that after death, it's a sort of an end to the cares and the woes of life and that you might find peace and enjoyment in some kind of afterlife. Um, but this one, however, is dedicated by um, parents to their daughter, um, a girl called Maconiana Severina. And um, it's uh, Severiana, rather. And um, it shows the girl here um, lying in the pose of the abandoned Ariadne. Um, and what's interesting here is that her face is sort of left uncarved. So this suggests that um, one reading of this is that the girl died before she was able to get married, which in the ancient world was kind of the, the destiny for most girls of, of good family, um, that they would make a successful marriage. So this suggests almost that, you know, she's died early. Um, she hasn't been able to get married in life, but that maybe she'll find this sort of happy marriage in the afterlife. Um, alongside the gods. So you can see how this myth is changed in different contexts in different places. So I think in a funeral context, it can allude to love and loss between a husband and a wife, um, and the sense of the pain of the bereaved person, whether that's a wife or a mother in the Artemidorus one. Um, and then the discovery ones, perhaps hope for an afterlife, hope for a more happy um, afterlife um, after the end and, and the sort of resolution of the frustrated hopes that weren't realised during one's actual life. So overall, I suppose my message is that myth is malleable, it's changeable. Um, you can select from it which bits you want to focus on the aspects that are most relevant to you. So most relevant to the context, but also most relevant to the viewer. And that means that we can never know for certain how people are looking at these images. Uh, all we can do is look at texts, we can look at the context, we can kind of think about how they might have meant. Um, but it's also up to the person looking at them to impose their own ideas and meanings. Um, and that's why I think it's so exciting to look at, because there's lots of scope for interpretation and for sort of creativity here. OK, so I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the lectures as well. Goodbye. <laughs>